if they are, if we are live. Um, let's see. Still waiting. I feel like the character in Inspector Gadget right now. Claw. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, welcome everybody. We are so happy to. Um, we're so happy. I think we're on. Yes, we are. We are live. Okay. All right. so happy you are joining us for today's um, Facebook Live with the Alliance and. Um, two of our unbelievably fabulous and amazing support group facilitators, um, Jess Sprangle and Kate Peoples that um, facilitate our weekly support group um, from um, from Austin. And I, when we started putting together these Facebook Lives, we really wanted to you know, bring you um, the best people we know and um, really give you an opportunity to ask questions. So please feel free to make comments during um, the Facebook Live. We have received um, a bunch of questions prior to this Facebook Live that we'll definitely, um, definitely address. But more than anything, I want to just take a few minutes to let you guys introduce yourselves to um, our amazing um, you know, followers. Um, so Kate, why don't we start with you? Just share a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Okay. So my name is Kate Peoples. I'm a therapist here in Austin, Texas, um, in private practice, um, and then co-facilitate the support group with Jess. Um, and got in, I feel like it's important to say got involved with the Alliance because of uh, meeting you at the Eating Disorders Coalition and doing advocacy day work. So um, accessibility for for eating disorder care is super important to me and always has been and it's really the foundation of what I do. So awesome. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing time and space with us. So Jess, you want to give us a little bit of feedback? Sure. Um, so I'm Jess, uh, Jess Pringle, and I'm also a therapist in the community here in Austin. Um, also, this is my little cat friend and she will probably be here for most of this. Um, so I'm also a cat friend in Austin and see a lot of young folks, um, so adolescents to adults. And I also co-facilitate the group, which Kate just, I have been absorbed into the Alliance family <laughs> through Kate, and I'm very happy for that. So I am super glad to participate in this because yeah, access to care right now is really important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that I just wanted to share um, with our um, amazing followers is first and foremost, is this is the first time that you're tuning in um, to the Alliance's page or to any of our Facebook lives. Um, so the Alliance is a national nonprofit that does outreach, education, early intervention, advocacy, um, and really support for all eating disorders. So um, Austin is one of our 19 free weekly clinician-led support groups. Um, we do um, referrals to care for all, all levels of care. And we do a lot of educating our front care responders, so doctors, nurses, dentists, um, to really give them the tools to recognize and refer and to be able to know better. Because I'm sure for a lot of you guys out there, you may not have had the most amazing first times or, or experiences with like your doctors or with your dentist or with whoever um, surrounding their knowledge about eating disorders. Um, so our goal at the Alliance is really to arm arm practitioners and hope that they don't say the stupid shit that they typically say. Um, you guys know what I mean. And I will definitely sort of put this caveat that I may have a little bit of a potty mouth and I try really hard to like curb it, but. Yeah. I was wondering if we were cursing today, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, but yeah, so we're here to support you. Um, we have a bunch of different things going on um, during this crazy time. Um, so definitely continue to, you know, touch base with the Alliance during this time and, and give us an opportunity to support you. So um, before we dive into the questions, um, one thing that I think is so spectacular that I think our followers need to know about you guys is that um, first and foremost is that, um, you know, you guys have um, lived experience and you guys utilized your lived experience um, to really make a difference, to really use that to pay it forward. Um, and I think that you guys are phenomenal. And I think that, that you really do bring, um, you bring such a different, um, I would say, angle of having that empathy and then having the clinical skills. So thank you guys both for, for paying it forward and for um, 
for doing so much for so many. Um, so first and foremost, the first question that I want to ask you, Kate, um, and then have, you know, you can definitely follow up, Jess, is um, what have you found to be helpful um, with your clients during this period of uncertainty? I think first and foremost, it's just been really important to validate that this is an incredibly weird experience um, and that, you know, there's that search kind of for normalcy doesn't really exist within something that is so absolutely abnormal. Um, and so after validating that, really looking for like, okay, so knowing this isn't super normal, how, how do we create some structure and routine with mm -hmm. them? Because for most, for most of my clients, a few of them do, but like don't work from home. Um, yeah. And so this is incredibly, incredibly new. And so figuring out like, what are you going to do with your time now? Um, how can you, how can you add in things that are going to support your mental health? Something I've been recommending to clients is like, immediately, can you get outside? Granted, it's, it's really nice weather right here right now in Austin. Um, yeah. So how do you get outside first thing in the morning, even if that's just sitting outside? How can you mm -hmm. stay in contact with people uh, mm -hmm. that we are I, we are maybe physically isolated right now, but we don't have to be socially isolated in this moment. 100%. Yeah. And so just figuring out like, what does your, what can we make your life look like right now that feels, feels manageable in just this really chaotic time? Yeah. Yeah. Just, do you want to, do you want to add anything to that? I mean, all the, all the same things. We're fortunate. We have nice weather. Um, mm -hmm it is easy to recommend to people to go outside. Um, however, I know like I see a lot of clients, I would say 90% of my clients have eating disorders and mm -hmm. encouraging them to get outside, but not, not be using the outdoors as a, as an avenue for behaviors has been an interesting balance. Um, but yeah, I mean, so much of this is about making it survivable. Like how do you, you know, how do you use the resources that you like can access while, just getting through like doing doing the next right thing even if it's the smallest next right thing and I see I love that um you, you just shared that because I think you know so many of us that have experienced eating disorders that are experiencing eating disorders get really stuck in the black or white all or nothing like either I'm going to do perfect in my recovery or therefore I'm going to act out in my eating disorder and you know Dr. Hendelman our, our clinical director likes to say good enough is good enough and I think that this is a perfect time of saying, you know, you're not going to get it right all the time. You're not going to get it quote unquote perfect all the time. So how, like, how, like we hear about like giving yourself grace, right. And giving yourself that permission to be imperfect. What are some thoughts on how to execute that? Because I mean, great. It's in theory, right? Like it's okay. I'll be good enough. But how do you make that work? You know, I think, you go. I think for me, sometimes knowledge is really helpful. And this is something I've been sharing with my clients. And honestly, it's just been really helpful for me is first to recognize that we are in a really traumatic experience, mm -hmm. that this is actually a trauma, this chaotic time. And it's really, it's really activating to our nervous system. And, you know, for me, that helps me kind of realize like, okay, I'm not going to be able to totally access maybe some of the skills that I normally would, or it's going to take a lot of extra effort. Um, and so being armed with that knowledge helps me hold compassion for myself of like, yeah, today I just felt really, really anxious all day and I did the best I could to get through it. And my, my nervous system is kind of shot right now, but that's like, I'm kind of rolling with the punches in this moment. Totally. We have a question. So, um, a good question that we just got in is what if the only connections you generally have are at work and without that there's total social isolation. So, um, I think that that's a really good question. So Jess, do you want to go ahead and address that? It's, it's funny. Um, because like life as a, as a private practice therapist is very isolating. So, so mm -hmm. many of my connections are at work and with my clients and with, um, even like my sweet mates and seeing people in my community. So, I mean, I hear you. It is, it is really weird to not have those connections readily at hand. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I don't think that you're like it, with working from home in particular, like you might have access to phone calls still with these people that you see or even video calls. I know that that's Zoom is picking up a lot of business. Yeah. Um, 
But beyond that, there are also now, and even through the Alliance, there's a lot of resources available that are online that are not just like, you know, you don't have to be friends with these people to, in order to access these resources. Like the Alliance is offering now two check-ins weekly um, with Joanna. And I know that there are a lot of other clinicians in the community also offering like Instagram lives um, or virtual groups for meals and things like that. And I think the majority of these services are free mm -hmm. um, because I think as a community, as a community, we're all trying to pitch in and help each other because yeah, like connection is about so much more than just friends, like everybody, you know, now like you don't get to go to like target and talk to the checkout person. And there's so much that we, we lose. I think my credit card is very excited that I can't go to Target right now. I, I just have to say that because, you know, you go in for the $5 item and you come back with like $250 worth of stuff in bags and you're like, I needed all of it. So, I mean, that might be the only positive about that, but it's so true. I mean, I think that... I think that the really scary thing about it is that eating disorders really do breed in social isolation, right? They um, they alienate you from people, that, that large wall comes up. Um, and so it can be very inviting to go back to things that are very um, second nature, like as they are in the eating disorder, right? Like even though they're maladaptive coping skills, they are coping skills. And so, you know, when you're in this forced social isolation, it's very easy to sort of go back into it, fall back into that, that real social isolation. And so um, I definitely love like all of like the online check-ins. Um, one of the things too, that we've heard a lot is, um, you know, like having coffee dates with people, you know, like having these virtual coffee dates, um, you know, having um, meal meals with people. I know that there's um, a really amazing Instagram site that literally just popped up overnight mm -hmm. um, with a bunch of um, health at every size clinicians that are doing every two hours or doing virtual meal support, like for, mm -hmm. for snacks and for meals. Um, so definitely, you know, reach out and use like social media, but I think we also have to be very cognizant of the fact that not all social media outlets can be healthy now. So I'm thinking, um, Kate, if you can share like what to look out for in, you know, like healthful support and helpful support as a, as opposed to possible harmful support during this time. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is a conversation that just in general, I feel like I'm having with clients all the time is curating your social media feed. So it's stuff you want to see and stuff that is helpful for you. Yeah. Um, but even so now it's been interesting because it's felt like the revival of, of chain mail through Instagram tagging. And if I see one more push up challenge, I'm going to lose my mind. Um, <laughs> but I think it's, you know, being mindful about, I mean, the conversation goes back to like the fat phobia that quarantine is really bringing up for a lot of people and being yeah. able to kind of like look for the diet culture and fat phobia that's happening in our culture, the the discussions about like movement and weight gain like are so rooted in fat phobia. Um, and so one, being educated about that, following accounts that are producing content about that mm -hmm. as well and able to point it out. Something that I think is so helpful is when it feels really difficult to hold a space for thoughts counter to your eating disorder, seeking out resources that can do that for you instead. Yeah. So whether that's podcast um, accounts of health at every size clinicians, mm -hmm. uh, finding, you know, even like, I I love a good recovery meme account that's pointing out all of this, yeah. all the stuff that's happening now as well, finding some humor and that can be helpful. But being, you know, cognizant about kind of the intention behind behaviors or following certain accounts too. Like, yeah. It can be really help, helpful yeah. if done in an appropriate way. And there are, are a lot of things I've seen on social media that maybe aren't super appropriate or helpful with that. And so knowing for you, what's the intention behind it? Um, that might even include checking that out with someone else, like a, a friend that's also in recovery or support group or your treatment team. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, if <laughs> I also just think like blanket rule, if you see someone talk about weight gain and quarantine, unfollow them. Unfollow that shit. You don't need it. <laughs> my my yeah. rule. Yeah. 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 yeah, and and I think like um 
you know, what are some, I said, like, and I know you brought up several of them, but what are some like red flags as opposed to like, you know, I should not be following this or this might not be, might be the right people or the right podcast. Um, you know, like I, and, and sometimes, sometimes it's tricky because sometimes like you start following one person and then like, you know, three more people are suggested and that one person that you're following is fantastic. So then you're like, well, this person's great. So obviously these people are going to be fine too. And you follow them. So Jess, what are some like red flags to be looking out for? That's a good question. Cause there are a lot of people who, who fence sit, um, which is basically they, there's some saying of a lot of the right things and then some incorporation of like, but weight loss. Um, so it's, I think things to look out for, especially now, um, if people are really prioritizing or pushing for um, like, oh, well, you know, you should try to get your hands on X types of food and like, you know, don't don't be eating processed foods or really, which is right now is really not the point um, because to be focusing on like, oh, can you get certain food? Um, so I think any any account right now, too, that's like kind of capitalizing on the time as like a way to push a brand or a way to push like a certain program that they're wanting to people to do. Um, like if you're reading my, my rule of thumb is if you're reading something and you have an icky feeling, like trust the icky feeling because sure. it's probably telling you something. Um, sure. and even if sometimes I'm looking at it and I'm like, I don't know what is wrong here, but something mm -hmm. doesn't feel right. And you know, ultimately it will show itself even if it's in someone's later posts. But mm -hmm. a lot of the times, People do portray what sort of stuff they're they're really thinking, even if it's not in that particular post you're looking at. Absolutely, I think that's such great feedback. Um, what would you say to our listeners who you know typically have a very hard time reaching out? Um, you know that that like don't want to pick up that like ten ton phone. Um, and I feel like we have so many different opportunities, like literally at our fingertips. Like, what would you tell that person about like giving them the just sort of assisting them to reach out? Like what, what are some words of wisdom that, that you can give to them, Kate? You know, I, it's kind of like that, that both and thing that it can be, it can be really hard and you are still able to do that hard thing. Mm -hmm. that, you know, it doesn't have to be, Oh, it's really hard. So I can't, can't do it. But I, you know, I also think it's remembering you know, eating disorder, like being in recovery from an eating disorder can just feel really isolating in general. Um, and a lot of time we can feel really isolated with like maybe anxiety or emotions that we're experiencing. And so I think it's helpful in this moment to really widen that perspective that mm -hmm. everyone is struggling right now. Um, and whether or not they have an eating disorder, everyone is struggling to figure out like what's going on, uh, how to deal with this. And so, you know, knowing that that you're you're not alone that i think those those attempts at connection are going to be so appreciated in mm -hmm. this moment um yeah and, you know giving yourself that opportunity to also help someone else with connecting to them as well i always think too if reaching out feels really hard knowing that you don't have to reach out to someone and be like hey this is what's up with my eating disorder yeah. just reach out to someone and talk and connect yeah uh, that's always the most shocking thing to clients where it's like, oh, I don't have to like just immediately tell them all of the things that are wrong. It's like, no, you could just say hi. Yeah. <laughs> there doesn't have to be an agenda. It's more about like, oh, like you just want to talk to this person. And sometimes it takes the like the weight of it off, pun intended, but it's just not quite as heavy. You know, I and, and I think we, uh, we talked about this actually in, I, I think it was one of the um, check-ins last week is that I think, and I can talk for, from personal experience that for me, when I was thinking about who could be my support, they had to be like the perfect support, right? They had to support me in my eating disorder recovery, in my anxiety, in my life, in my, like, it was just, I kept on looking for this perfect person. And I was, I, I'm always reminded about, um, you know, so but my, my family is French every summer I used to go to Paris and spend time with my grandmother. And I always found it so amazing that like, we didn't go like to a Publix or a Kroger, like a grocery store. We went to like the different places to get certain things. Like we went to the bread store to get the bread, the meat store to get the meat, um, you know, the pastry place 
store to get the pastries. And like we went to get specific things from specific stores. And I really tried to incorporate that in my recovery and the work that I do now is that you can reach out to certain people for certain things. And that does not mean that they can't be overall supportive. They just might not be the person you go to for like your eating disorder recovery or like, hey, I'm really having a hard time with anxiety. Like this is the person to go to. So I think it's it's remembering that there is not a perfect there's not a, a perfect person, a perfect scenario. Um, you know, so I think that just remembering that picking up the phone and just saying hi to like, you know, your grandpa or to like, you know, maybe it's connecting to a coworker. Um, they can all be different versions of support. Um, and I think that that's really important. Would you agree? Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. I love that metaphor. That's so yeah. nice. <laughs> Um, so uh, we have a bunch of questions that came up. Thank you guys so much for posting these amazing questions. We'll definitely try to get get through them. And if we don't, I'll make sure that, that Kate and Jess respond to them and we'll put them up on our Facebook page. Um, any suggestions for people who thrive on routine? I mean, I, I don't, I personally don't know anybody like that. Like, hello, that's my middle name. Um, so I totally can empathize, um, but find it difficult without accountability. And when when time is more fluid than it usually is. So that is like the ten million dollar question. I feel so. I would love both of you guys, um, both of you guys, to share. So, um, Jess, if you want to go ahead and get us started, sure. Um, so the question is, what do you do when time is a little bit more fluid and with it's hard to continue with routine if you don't have accountability? Yeah. Okay. Oh boy, um, I <laughs> certainly can relate to that. Um, I know that for me, the biggest, like the first thing to go is like getting up at the same time every day. Like if I don't have to be awake for something, I'm not going to be awake for something. But that totally like screws up my routine. Um, mm -hmm. So I think sometimes like making sure that you're getting up around the same time every day and like trying to follow, maybe not like rigidly follow like, okay, I'm going to get up at this time and then do this, 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 but more like, okay, how can I give myself the best chance? when I wake up in the morning <laughs> and then also like trying to go to bed at a reasonable hour slash like practicing good sleep hygiene, which means not staring at your phone for an hour before you sleep, which I should take my own advice. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Me too. But I think right now too, like your routine is going to be upended and disrupted. And it's also okay to like practice some compassion around that because it's not going to be perfect. And you might, like not get certain things done that you did before all the time. And that's, I mean, that's okay. Like the world is, is a really weird place right now. So like, you know, not like not putting your phone away for an hour before bed, like, okay. Like that might happen a little bit more often because you just need a little bit more connection than maybe you were meeting before. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think that the conversation I've been having this, this past week in particular has been like, you know, time time is a construct in general, but this weekend is so much more of a construct than normal. Um, you know, and what I've noticed as well is like my daily routine routine has really changed because one, I don't have to commute anywhere right now. Um, so a part of me, you know, I think it's noticing like where's that resistance and frustration coming up about your routine, and like Jess was saying, can you be flexible about it, like? For me, I really do want to, like, in my brain, I'm like, I should be waking up earlier. And then I had to level with myself and be like, but why? Where are you going? And, <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm tired. And I'm just going to take this opportunity to sleep in a little later. And mm -hmm. I've been waking up around the same time. It's just later than I think I should. Yeah. Um, and so it's finding that middle path uh, between structure and you know, making it, having structure, but not going into rigidity, really. Um, and, and that's so I, hard. That is so <laughs> hard. Uh, you know, and I think it's, for me, what I found helpful is I will make a list of some things that like, maybe the next day I want to do. And then I, my list always end up way longer than they need to be. So it's like, pick two yeah. things off of them. Pick two. Yeah. So today it was like a vacuum and I'm going to do some laundry. Um, <laughs> And that's that's enough. So it's you know it's adjusting adjusting expectations, um, and then knowing like where do you need that structure? Where can you set up that accountability? Uh, kind of like we were talking about. Can you do dinner with someone via FaceTime? Can you you know set up around this time? I'm going to call this person. Um, not 
not necessarily someone making sure that like, did you do it? But having those points of contact throughout the day that can, that you schedule out with someone else if possible. So you act, at least have a little bit of a routine that you are sticking to. Yeah, see, I think I think that's so important is to, you know, if you if you have the ability to access, um, you know, clinical support with your team, I think that's like a must right now. Um, being able to check in, like being able to join like our check ins, for example, or other online support groups, um, you know, putting things like these Facebook lives in your calendar and then also giving yourself some time to just sit on the couch and watch Netflix if that's what you want to watch and not having any um you know, and not giving yourself like grief for actually being tired. Like, I don't know about you guys, but I find myself to be just a lot more tired in general where that I, and I'm like, I don't understand. Like typically I'm here and there and running around and my three and a half year old who's crazy. And like, but I find myself to be just a lot more and excuse this word, but like weighted down, like just like, I feel like everything, like the, the weight of the world is just so much heavier right now. Um, so giving yourself that time to, I can just sit on the couch and it's okay. And that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with me. It just means that I'm a human that's being, and that is living in this time of just honestly craziness. So yeah. Um, yeah. yeah and it's hard. I can't imagine, I really can't imagine having a child around this. <laughs> um, I was thinking about that yesterday, that there are so many people who have children who they need to be doing like school with. Yeah. And yeah. I, mean, I think especially for, um, you know, people kind of going through this plus an eating disorder, plus managing a child and homeschooling, like there's, that's so much, that would be so much for any person, let mm -hmm. alone someone who's also managing a mental illness. So it's just, it just seems like now on top of all the things that we already feel we need to do to be productive, there are like 25 more things. And, and like those are not so absolutely necessary. Like they're, they're negotiable. Everything right now is, is pretty negotiable except basic needs. 100%. And I guess that brings me to my next question. And I know that we have a lot of them, but this one was really like top of mind is, how do you make sure that you take care of your basic needs when that negative voice is really screaming at you to do X, Y, and Z? Like, what have you found to be helpful for your clients? Um, and maybe even for you guys um, living in, in, you know, like living with experience to just like, how do you navigate this time to just do the next, like in Olaf's wor like words, like do the next right thing? <laughs> Yeah, I know. I'm trying to, that's the question, right? <laughs> and really, I think it's, you know, we can get into such a power struggle with those thoughts too. And it really doesn't, doesn't generally change the thoughts. It just kind of gets us fused with them. Mm -hmm. um, and so just practicing noticing those thoughts, like, okay, yeah, that's the thought labeling it. I think, you know, um, I've been listening to Brene Brown's podcast. Um, and so, you know, she talks a lot of, in the first episode about first times, um, which I highly recommend, um, mm -hmm. but the effing first times is what it, yeah. But, um, but that, um, she, you know, naming, naming what you're going through takes power away from it. Um, and so if we can just label like, okay, this is what my brain does. Um, like this is, it's trying, you know, what I've tried to do with clients is really hold space for understanding that your eating disorder has served a purpose and mm -hmm. it's trying to serve that purpose right now. It may not be super effective. Um, and, but we can recognize it's trying to be protective. Um, and so if we can at least hold space for that, rather than try and like fight, fight against it, like, okay, you're trying to protect me. This isn't super helpful. I'm going to do this instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I could have said that better. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else that you want to add to that, Jess? I mean, I think similarly to Kate, like right now is going to just be a time of a lot more, potentially a lot more eating disorder thoughts. And mm -hmm. because there's a lot more room for them, I think there's just a lot more, maybe not more downtime for everybody. I know I have had less downtime, but more like open time for at weird. Yeah, intervals. totally. But, um, I mean, I think that just leaves a lot of room for like thoughts about things that maybe weren't on your, your mind all the time. Um, 
And I think like, especially folks with eating disorders, and I can speak to this personally, like so much of my recovery was figuring out how to sit in downtime and just like function without like having something to do and filling the space with behaviors or Mm -hmm. just nonsense productivity. Um, So, I mean, I think this is a really good opportunity, which is like, it's annoying. Like I can hear my clients being like, oh my God, Jess, like that's the most annoying reframe. Um, (laughs) But, but it's true. It's like this, it is not a good situation, but it's also a good opportunity to practice being able to sit or just like, all right, I can't be productive. I'm going to (laughs) color, you know, like, and Hey, coloring is productive in its own way. So using the time in a way that maybe you're not really able to use your time otherwise. hundred percent. And I think one of the things that, that I've actually had to even remember for me, even with all, all my recovery time under my belt is that there's, there's nothing wrong with going back to basics. And what I mean is, is that, you know, whether you had like a meal plan, like when, like an early recovery, like this is if like you have like advanced recovery or, or if you've been in, you know, if you've been recovered or whatever, however you use that word is there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with going back to like going down to like the actual basics, whether, you know, whether it's like fo- going back and following that plan or if it's reaching out for support, um, you know, and, and I, even sometimes I have to remind myself that it's like, you know, I'm, you know, I have 21 years of recovery under my belt. And when shit hits the fan, like for me, like I have to be like, I just need to like sit down and like eat them and have my meal. Like I'll never forget. Like I got a really, um, I got really, really physically ill about like, I think it was like about 15 years ago. And I wasn't able to nourish myself. It's not that I didn't want to, it was I was physically able to not. And like, it's just crazy. Like those, you know, the gremlin started talking. And I remember doing a presentation at a local hospital with Dr. Hendelman, our, our clinical director. And she like sort of looked at me and she goes, sit down and eat the damn sandwich. And I was like, and there it is, like, there it is, you know, and I'm lucky that we had that kind of relationship where it was like, you're right. Um, but it's being cognizant and open and accountable during this time is going to be so important. And realizing that that literally sometimes all you can do is like that next that that next step. And I think that that's that's very difficult for a lot of people that are following this tonight. Um, and a lot of people that are experiencing is that we all like to have control and there's literally no one that has control over the situation. So what do you do? Like, what do you do with it? Cause I, I need to know that. <laughs> I, this is a conversation I've had this week too. It, you know, it's been helpful. It's something that I've, I've had to do too. Cause my husband and I have both been like, Oh my God, all like in and out of that all week. But, yeah. um, for the past two weeks, it feels like, but um, focusing on honestly those small things that you can control in your day to day, that and that that goes back to a lot of what we've already talked about with like structure and routine and yeah, we cannot we cannot control what's happening outside of the walls of our home really, and especially if you live with other people, you can't control what they're doing either. Um, but knowing that you can control how you are taking care of yourself um and you can control kind of like what information you are taking in um for me i've really had to put a a limit on taking in on taking in news it's not it's not helpful um and just figuring out kind of like you know i can i can most of the time control how i react to a situation um sometimes my anxiety gets the best of me and then I can choose how I respond to that yeah 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 Yeah. a lot of it too is radical acceptance um of course our favorite (laughs) our group is like oh radical acceptance (laughs) (laughs) um but it is I mean this is kind of the again like a perfect example of what you need to write like what it what is radical acceptance like not approving of something but like having to accept it anyway and yeah I mean that is a lot of like my day (laughs) my days recently because yeah like I am someone who thrives on human contact I like love being out of my house my husband's very different and he's like I think a little thrilled that this is happening and he doesn't have to leave the house and there's like a reason for it whereas I'm like oh my god 
Um, and it, it is, it's just like, I have to almost walk myself through it every morning. Like it's going to be okay or as okay, whatever the new okay is, that's what it's going to be. And like, I'm nothing negative is happening to me right now in this moment. And like, okay, how can I use my resources just to help myself, help my clients and also like just make the most of this day and like easy, like simple statements like that sometimes is just what gets me through. Um, but yeah, also limiting access to news and even social media. Like I have taken to like signing out of Instagram now after like using it for maybe 20 minutes because it's just like endless scrolling that is a lot of the same messaging and it all is anxiety provoking. And so much fear inducing, I think too. I, you know, one of the things that, that we talk a lot about in like our Monday night group is that, that we can get through this. We can get through anything for like a certain amount of time. And the biggest thing is that you don't have to like something or want to do something to do it. And like, I, I have to tell you, like, I just repeat that to myself all the time. Like, I don't have to like this to do it. And I think that for me, that's what ca- that's actually what kept on pushing me forward in my recovery journey um, was that, you know what, I don't have to really want to do this to do it. I don't have to like it to do it. So I think that that's always such a big part of it. Um, something that someone just shared is that, you know, n- having no control um, is a little scary, but knowing that we're all in this together ha- um, gives a little bit more perspective and feeling connected. And I really love that. Um, you know, something that um, that, uh, that actually a few people um, brought up, we have so many great questions that are coming. Thank you guys. Um, is, you know, even doing something like going to the grocery store right now that, I mean, they have instilled the fear of God in you to like go to the grocery store. And you, if you already are someone that has a very hard time going to the grocery store in general, what are maybe just a few tips or some feedback that we can give to um to people that are listening so i i know even personally like going to going to the supermarket here when like even before they announced shelter in place it was scary i felt like it was like the walking dead type of situation it was Mm -hmm. a little uh overwhelming but i know um like that, obviously, like I look, I think about that versus like, okay, when I would need to go to the supermarket when I was in early recovery and two very different things. Um, mm-hmm. Something I think that helped help me then and helps me now is if I go into the supermarket with music, like or if I have my headphones, or if I'm listening to a book, like, yeah, it might not necessarily be um, the most polite to other passerby, but it's really not about being polite in the supermarket. Like you got, and especially right now, like you got to get in and you got to get out. And some for mm-hmm. some folks, I think there is a time limit. Um, so yeah, I mean, so bringing in like something that is an external resource that you can use, no one has to be like privy to it. Yeah. Um, and honestly, sometimes like being on the phone, <laughs> I know that again, it's not the most polite thing, but like at this point, there's like five to, five to 15 people in the supermarket. Like I think you being on a quiet phone call is not going to be so disruptive. Like you're allowed to have support in that way. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, you know, I think too, this has been a conversation I've had a lot because I, you know, granted, I don't know what it's like in other places. I know our grocery store here is doing a lot of like delivery and curbside now. And, Mm -hmm. and they're not, you're not able to get a date for like, a week out and so you know I was having this conversation with my husband this morning because as we were ordering our groceries for like a week out talking about how, how difficult it is to know what we will need in a week and we discussed how difficult and one unattainable that is for some people that maybe don't have the financial resources to do that, but also for people who struggle with their relationship with food mm-hmm. right um, and so I think of it too as like going back to the basics as well like maybe this isn't the time you're gonna get super creative with your challenges you're just gonna like stick to things that you know meet your needs in this moment um and it it really is a practice in flexibility too and so knowing if like okay if i'm gonna cook this i need like going in with the idea of like i need three vegetables and I need some, some fruit and a protein. And so we're less tied to like, this is what I have to get. And more so like, it's going to be what they have. 
Um, well, and I think that there's so much anxiety around that too, especially yeah. people that like are still like connected to, you know, their safe foods. And then like when they go and they, they go in for these specific things, like there's a lot of anxiety around it not totally. being there too. So um, being, you know, being kind with yourself and giving yourself the grace to say, okay, instead of these three specific things, these are the three things that could fit this. Um, any other thoughts about how, how you can give yourself that, that fluidity to be able to not to walk away from these specific things to what they have available? I think it's in some ways it's like, it's similar to like just to early recovery. It's like, I can make this choice or I cannot. like it's, uh, that is very black and white, but I think, you know, you could go into the grocery store sometimes it, when this stuff isn't happening and they might not have the thing that you feel the this with. Like, I know that like that is half that happened to me in early recovery. And I had like a meltdown of course, because that is just what's going to happen. Yeah. And then I realized like, okay, well, this is a, again, this is an opportunity. What mm -hmm. do I do? Like, mm -hmm. I can either, okay, walk away and then just not get an alternative, but what is that going to do for my recovery? Like, how is that going to move me forward and get me closer to the life I want to live? And it's not. So sometimes, yeah, like, you have to get something different. If you can get something different that's, like, similar, I know that that can be a very helpful stepping stone. So, like, sure. okay, this is just something that's similar. It's a little different. And then mm -hmm. ultimately maybe I can get something different entirely. It's not... So it doesn't have to be so rigid, which I think is really easy for me to say from this place. But I, mean, I can also remember being yeah. in that place of total meltdown in the grocery store. Yeah, and this is what we talk about with like cope ahead plans too a lot. It's like okay, so I know worst case scenario for me right now in this moment, going in is they're out of this food. How do I cope effectively with that? Who right. could I call? Is there someone that I know that like? Um, to kind of help coach me through this. Do I have a dietitian that I can work with before and we can figure out what's plan B and C and D, you know, um, and figuring, you know, working through that with other people and I, that can kind of support you through that process. Right. And people might not be as like as emotionally activated in that moment. Who are seeing it from a dip, very different perspective, and I think I think you guys said it so so beautifully. It's a, just like that that planning ahead and giving yourself that um, just that 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 space to be like, okay, can I get something that's either similar or you know, can I what what would happen? Like, let's play out this scenario with my dietitian or with my therapist because it, it we really need to like develop a plan because I think especially like an earlier recovery, like having a plan really does, um, really does help. Um, so I guess I know that we're starting to come to the end of our time, which I could totally talk to you guys all night. You're phenomenal and amazing. Um, so I would like to ask each of you, what are you guys doing in terms of self care? Um, not only what you are doing, but what have you heard from your, your clients that has been helpful? So I guess first more for your clients and it may be the same thing you guys are doing. So I would love to um, hear from both of you. So I'm laughing because I, yeah, I got that question so many times yesterday from clients. I think they're so curious, like, what are you doing? Like, why are you doing <laughs> yourself? And I'm like, I'm doing the same things you're doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but, you know, what I've been encouraging clients to do during this time is, you know, there are there are certain things that you do on a regular basis to take care of yourself. Again, basic things like nourishing yourself, taking a shower, et cetera, that might seem even harder to do now. And doing those things, that is like basic, but very necessary mm -hmm. care. Mm -hmm. And like thinking about, okay, other things like I really it's, um, someone in group always talks about like multi-sensory coping and I talk with clients a lot about that because that's like that's been so helpful to me like that because I realize I do that a lot but mm -hmm. you know, doing something in front of a tv or like listening to a podcast while doing a puzzle or you know fill in the blank just trying mm -hmm. to make, make it more of an experience versus just like, okay, now I have to take care of myself and do this, like, check the box thing, mm -hmm. um, which I think sometimes people get stuck in. But, I mean, it's, I think there are so many different ways you can cope, and none of them are, 
I don't want to say none of them are wrong. There are definitely maladaptive ways to cope. And right now we want to encourage the adaptive ways. Exactly. Um, but, and there are a million and one adaptive ways to cope and ways that I might cope that are different from Kate and Joanna and everyone else. Um, but it is, you know, how you, cho whatever you choose is not bad or negative. It might be maladaptive, but like the adaptive ways might not seem as productive as other ways, but that doesn't really matter right now. Like mm -hmm. it's just doing things to like get you through. Yeah. Yep. For, yeah. you know, for me, I was trying to think about it. One of the first things I did when I knew we were going to have to switch to telehealth and mean home all the time was, uh, you know, I'm very privileged to have a home office but it was a mess and so I cleaned it out um, mm -hmm. and for for me just trying to find some order in each day whether that's like um, making making our bed fully um, yeah. mm -hmm. vacuuming up the dog hair um, so I don't have to stare at it all day um, but also something I found really helpful um, and that I wanted to get into and just you know, for one reason or another, I think we all find those reasons that we don't do those things we want to do um, has been more mindfulness headspace right now for um, health professionals has two months free. And there are tons of mm -hmm. other resources out there for those that aren't health professionals, like Insight Timer, Simple Practice, um, mm -hmm. but just like three minutes of that outside yeah. every day has been really helpful. I you know, have the routine of like making my coffee and sitting outside now to make sure that I'm getting some sun, but really finding those, those things that seem relatively small. And this is what my clients mm -hmm. and I have been discussing that seem relatively small, don't take necessarily a lot of time, but kind of like add some, some structure to your day or break it up. So it doesn't feel like all of the same. Like if I'm going to sit in my home office and do telehealth, I'm going to move out of my office after that, or um, I'm going to like actually sit at my table for for meals. I'm going to go outside and spend a little time outside, breaking it up because it can feel even if like you don't have a space with a bunch of different rooms, can you sit in different spaces where you are? Can you stand outside? How can you make it so it's just not kind of like one of the same? Yeah. I love that one of the things that I read was um, like, if you have a, like if you have a commute, for example, and you usually, and look, someone actually just posted what I was going to say. Um, but so Sarah, you are my spirit animal. Um, but um, like, but to do the same things that you do on your commute. Um, like, so like for me, like I listen to, to books on tape, I, I'm like, a, like I, I go through audible books, like it's nobody's business. So for me, it's like listening, still taking like that. I mean, my commute is like three seconds, but still giving my time to, you know, listen to like an audible in the morning and listen to some of my audible in the afternoon. Um, so it's sort of like, that gives me that centered, um, you know, between home and like work. Um, so giving, giving myself that, that grace of just, you know, sort of transitioning in and transitioning out. Um, so I think that's, but that was super, that was super helpful too. Um, I think also just being cognizant of the fact that there's no, and I think that you guys said this, there's no perfect way to self care right now. There's nothing that you should be doing perfectly. Um, some days self care is going to be easier than others. Some days it's going to come a lot easier than than others, and that's okay to give yourself the grace like during that time. Um, but you know, it's just trying to have. For me, it's just trying to find different ways. Like, I mean, one thing that has been really amazing is that because I'm not running all over the place, it's also giving me some time to like ground with the people that are in my house physically, but also to reach out to people that I haven't talked to. Like I, like I had, um, I had non cocktails cocktails with like my girlfriends from, from California that are also um, like sheltering in place. And like, I don't even remember the last time that all three of us were on a call together. So even reaching out to people that you haven't reached out to in a while, like for me has been very, very good um, for my soul, for my being. Um, so I just, I'm, I'm again, like so overcome with gratitude for, for you guys for um, spending time. And I know that we um, have so many questions that, haven't been addressed, so I will make sure that that we get you to um, answer those questions. 
Um, so just a few quick updates um, from, from our end. I hope that you guys enjoyed um, this Facebook Live. We have three others um, that are coming up in the next week. So I hope you'll join us um, on Monday at 5.30 p.m. We have representatives from the Eating Disorders Coalition um, that will be joining us on how to use your voice. I think, um, you know, Kate and I have, like, that's how we met. Like, that's how we fell in love. I like to say how we <laughs> um, was, you know, using our voices on the Hill. But there's so much going on even right now, like even with like the big bailout bill that just happened, like they there was some some parts that like mental health wasn't represented. And so there was a way for us to use our voice and reach out to our members. Um, so please join us. Um, Jillian Lampert's going to be on that call. Also, Katrina Velas Velasquez is going to be on that call. And also um, on Wednesday, um, McCall Dempsey is going to be hosting um uh, a Facebook Live um, with two amazing humans that um, literally missed their high school graduation because they were in treatment. And now they're going to be missing their college graduation because of, of the virus. So she's going to be talking um, okay. about maintaining recovery through um, disappointment mm -hmm. while socially distancing. So, um, you know, I think that's going to be a really great one. That's at six o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, and of course, we have our check-ins. Um, we've actually this week added a Saturday check-in. So we have one tomorrow at 11 a.m. Um, you can still register um, still register for that. Um, if you scroll to the top of our Facebook page, there's direct links. We have them on Saturday at 11 p.m. 11 a.m., excuse me, not p.m. <laughs> I'm just sleeping um, because that's what I do now. Um, and the evenings at seven o'clock PM. And then if you are a loved one of someone who's experiencing an eating disorder, we have um, our check-in at seven o'clock PM um, on Wednesdays. Um, Kate, Jess, you guys are just amazing. You fill up my cup. Thank you so much for taking the time on this um, on on this Friday night. Thank you for you know jumpstarting my weekend in this way. Um, we will post all of these Facebook lives will be, they'll be available for a while. They will also be available on our YouTube page. Um, but any last words? Oh, man, uh, it's hard. You know, this is hard and it's weird and we're all in it. We're, uh, we're all in it together. And then I heard high school musical in my head, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> thank God for Disney plus all I will say right now for me and for my little like nugget too. I might have to get it. I don't have it, but yeah, I mean, it's rough and like this, it's even, you know, I'm thinking like, even as a therapist, like there isn't a perfect way to, to cope with it or go through it. And so we really are all in it together, not in the high school musical way. <laughs> Although yeah. Zach Efron is very nice. To hold on, so. <laughs> Absolutely. And you know what, like, it, I know, like we've said it like 95 times in 95 different ways, but Give yourself grace. You know, we're all doing the best we can and good enough is good enough. So please take care of yourself. Um, look forward to seeing you Monday at 5.30 for our next check-in. Um, but thank you guys so much. Thank you guys. Have a great weekend and we will talk with you guys soon. Right. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. You.